Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Sports Legends of the Carolinas. I'm your host, Scott Fowler, sports columnist for the Charlotte Observer, where I've worked since 1994. And as always in this podcast, I'm traveling across the Carolinas, seeking out some of my very favorite sports legends. We're proud to say this episode is sponsored by Audi Charlotte. Celebrate the season with holiday savings on new Audis. You belong in an Audi from Audi Charlotte. For this episode, we're in Durham, North Carolina, very close to the campus of Duke University, and I'm delighted to have as a guest the one and only Steve Spurrier. In the late 1980s, Steve Spurrier was the head coach at Duke, leading the Blue Devils to an ACC football championship in 1989. As a player, he won the Heisman Trophy in 1966 at the University of Florida. Coach Spurrier then returned to Florida as its head ball coach in 1990. Spurrier led the Gators to multiple SEC titles, as well as the national championship in 1997. He has deep connections to both Carolinas because after Florida and a two-year stint with the NFL's Washington franchise, Spurrier came to South Carolina, where he was the head coach of the Gamecocks for a decade. He beat Clemson five straight times at one point before abruptly retiring in the middle of the 2015 season. We'd like to thank the Washington Duke Inn and Golf Club for providing us such a gorgeous space for this interview. Steve Spurrier, next on Sports Legends of the Carolinas. Coach Steve Spurrier, the one and only head ball coach, welcome to the show. Scott, good to be with you and and good to be recognized in the Carolinas. Uh, My mom and dad, both from Charlotte, went to the old Central High School there and uh, they're no longer with us, but they would be proud that I'd be considered a, a legend guy in the Carolinas because uh, they uh, both went through high school and uh, even took, I think, a business course there and so forth. So Charlotte is my hometown from way back from all my uncles and aunts and all that. I had not realized that until I, I did read your autobiography preparing for this and saw that they had met in youth group at church or something. And so Central High School was the... Was where they went to high school? They, yeah, now yeah. my dad was six or seven years older than my mom. Okay, so, yeah, uh, different times. Yeah, yeah. she uh, she played the piano and the organ in the church. My oh. dad was Presbyterian minister for, I don't know, 40 years or something like that. And uh, retired down in Florida near my sister and me. So uh, he saw a lot of our games when I coached at Florida. And uh, he was at uh, the national championship game. So anyway, he, he loves sports, and, mm-hmm. you know, I credit him for whatever athletic ability or whatever <laughs> I had because he, he really uh, promoted uh, sports, athletics, and he promoted winning. I tell you, mm. uh, he coached our Little League and Babe Ruth League baseball teams, mm-hmm. and he asked the kids one day, uh, how many of you believe in that saying, it's not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game? Well, all the, half the kids raised their hand, and he said, well, I don't believe that. He said <laughs> – if you're keeping score, you're supposed to try your best to win. And I've tried to instill that in every team I coach. If you're keeping score up there, we're supposed to try our best to win. Even like you're in pro ball and you're playing those exhibition and preseason yeah, games yeah. don't count, I still think you're supposed to try to win. Exhibitions, preseasons, whatever. It yeah, 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 As absolutely. long as you're keeping score. If you're not keeping score, well, we'll let everybody play. And <laughs> not ever look at the scoreboard. But anyway, yeah, my dad, uh, he hated losing. And uh, – Anybody that wins a lot, they hate losing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's start with this since we're in Durham, uh, very near the campus of Duke. Uh, You have said before, whatever kind of coach you became, it was because of Duke University. So why do you say that? Oh, I owe so much to Duke University. Uh, After NFL 10 years, well, Steve, what are you going to do? Well, what am I going to do? I said, you know what? I think I may want to try coaching. I think I've watched, I've been around some good coaches, and I've been around some bad ones. You know, we learn from good and bad. And uh, maybe if I got an opportunity to be be a coach in college, it doesn't seem like work because you're anxious to get to the office every day and uh, try to teach your players how to play the game and this, that, and the other. So uh, Coach Dickey at Florida gave me an opportunity. We all got fired after the first year. And Pepper Rogers had an opening. His quarterback just happened to leave. So I got to go to Atlanta for one year with Coach Pepper Rogers, and then they let him go. And I'd met Coach Red Wilson at Duke during spring recruiting in Atlanta uh, the year before. And uh, actually, Coach Rogers let me call the plays when we played Duke. 
and we, we scored 24, which was a lot for Georgia, Georgia Tech, Tech that year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I got in touch with uh, Coach Wilson, and he hired me as offensive coordinator my third year ever as an assistant coach. So really grateful for Duke. And, you know, a lot of my buddies said, Steve, you can't win at Duke. Nobody wins at Duke. Go somewhere where you can win if you want a coaching career. And I said, well, guess what? They're the only school that's offered me a chance. So I'm going to go there and give it the best I got. And uh, hopefully we can make winners there and, and move on or whatever. And, uh, but then I had a chance to come back again after the USFL folded. I had an opening here. And uh, Tom Butters hired me back in uh, 1987. So I had three wonderful years here and, of course, culminating with the ACC championship team of 89. This one's tipped away by Duke, and that is it. And that, that goal post is going to be history. I can tell you that right now as Duke has picked off North Carolina State. And there goes the goal post. And Steve Spurrier and Mike Hogwood are down on the field somewhere, I think. Right. That uh, is still remembered fondly, maybe the most fondly of any Duke team ever, that 1989 uh, team. What was the key to its success? Scott, it was a very interesting year because we opened up uh, one and three. Now, back in those days, we played six road games and five home games. Uh, we, we had to go get a paycheck, as Mr. <laughs> yeah. Butter said, to keep the football program going. Uh, so anyway, now we'd lost at Tennessee, at South Carolina, and, and at Virginia, which was a very good team that year also. Uh, and then we had Clemson coming to town. They were 4-0. And it was uh, – we had one of those emotional meetings. We're going to give it all we got. Uh, I learned back in uh, college from one of our assistant coaches, Gene Ellenson, that if you get the players to sign the chalkboard or grease board – that I'll give all I can to help my team try to win the game today. And so we had everybody sign the board, going to give it all literally some through the, the end of the game. And we're down 14 nothing at half, and then some miracles happened in that game. Uh, we'll talk about those a little later maybe. Uh, but anyway, we win the game and then win the rest of the conference games and, uh, and uh, win the ACC championship. Eight and three, uh, and Duke was winning, used to winning before you got here, a couple of games a year maybe, uh, so that was huge. From a rain-drenched Wallace Wade Stadium in Durham, it's the seventh-ranked Clemson Tigers of Danny Ford against the pass-minded Blue Devils of Steve Spurrier. Duke's only win of the season came here in Durham. It's been a frustrating one and three start for last season's ACC Coach of the Year. So today, the top-ranked defense meets the number one offense, Clemson and Duke here in Durham. Took a famous picture at the scoreboard uh, at Keenan Stadium of when y'all we beat them, beat UNC 41 to nothing, and that was uh, that's the one that people still remember fondly here, not so fondly, and at the other shade of blue in Chapel Hill. Are you glad you took that picture in '89? Uh, Scott, we didn't take that picture because we beat North Carolina. They were a sorry team that year. I think they were one in ten. Uh, we took that picture because we're ACC champs. I see. And uh, earlier, uh, we beat Maryland at Maryland. I think it was like forty-five to twenty-six. And uh, as we we're leaving, uh, one of our assistant coaches, Jim Collins, his wife always on the sideline taking pictures with her camera and so forth. And uh, I said, Jerry, we're going to get the team under the scoreboard. We have beaten Maryland at Maryland, first time since 1960. So it's 29 years since that had happened. <laughs> and uh, so the guys are – everybody had already left. We'd, we'd beaten them pretty good. And, and all the players were giving it thumbs up. As so I came in the locker room, I never will forget, I said, now, fellas, if we win the rest of them, we're going to take a picture at Chapel Hill because we'll be ACC champs. And, uh, and we talked about before the season uh, that uh, there's a, if we get on a roll, we could win the ACC championship. So we, we got on a roll, and actually we went in the locker room after that game in North Carolina, and one of the players said, Coach, how about the pitcher? Oh. I said, dang, let's go. <laughs> so we hustled out. Hardly anybody was in the stands. Uh, but fortunately, the clock operator left the score up there. That was so, nice. I, yeah. I want to thank him for doing that. But that was for winning the <laughs> ACC. It had nothing to do with uh, okay. North Carolina. I got gotcha. you. So you, you uh, were here for three uh, years as a head coach. Of course, Mike Krzyzewski, another one of our sports legends that we interviewed, uh, was here during that time. And also during when you were an offensive coordinator, right? And you wrote in your autobiography that – there would sometimes be some basketball games, football staff, basketball staff, and it was very difficult to beat, beat Coach K's team. And why was that? 
Well, Coach K, when he got close, he'd dribble in there, and if he missed, he called a foul. And he was the only head coach playing, so he uh, he got to referee and play. But uh, now we had some really good games over there, and usually it was uh, Coach K and a couple of his assistants, uh, yeah. maybe three of us us football assistants. Uh, playing half court and so forth. In Cameron? In or Cameron. Oh, yeah, in nice. Cameron. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, at lunchtime, uh, half, uh, basketball. So, yeah, we enjoyed that. It was good competition and so forth. But it was hard to beat Coach K's team. Mm -hmm. In fact, I don't know if we ever beat them, <laughs> come to think of it. Um, so we're in the midst of another football season now. And I wonder this. So you are uh, 78 now, although you look about 55. Yeah, but thanks. what do you miss about coaching this time of year? And what do you not miss about coaching? Uh, well, the thing I miss is the game itself, you know, being on the sideline, getting your guys ready to play, to, to go try to beat the other team, uh, the competition part. It was always my most fun part of it. Uh, no, I don't miss the NIL or the transfer portals and all that. So, uh, the, yeah, the game has really changed a lot. But on the other hand, you know, what's fair for one team is fair for the other. Uh, it seems like the same schools that are always at the top are going to continue being there because it seems like maybe they're the wealthiest uh, with the booster involvement in the money now and so forth. Uh, but it, it's still, college football still a great game. I mean, everybody's going. There's more money coming in. Uh, the coaches make more than they've ever made before, it's by rude. far. By far. So uh, it is what it is. And uh, But I, I miss the competition, uh, the game itself, I'd say the big thing. How would you have liked to coach in the transfer portal and NIL era? Well, if I had to, I'd be doing it like all these guys are doing. Right. Uh, I think I would uh, try to find me a couple of multi-millionaire guys that could afford, <laughs> you know, a little five, ten million here and there, right. and that would really help your program if you yeah. if you've got those guys. Uh -huh. uh, but other than that, uh, yeah, I sort of wish they would let guys earn their money as they go rather than getting it up front. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, you mean the players? Yeah, the players yeah, themselves. Right, right. And, uh, of course, that on the other hand, hey, the coaches get it up front too. You know, we've, yeah. uh, you give a guy a six, seven-year contract, all guaranteed, so he doesn't have to do much to, to uh, get that money also. So, you know, the coaches have been getting big money. Might as well, you know, pay the players now, just like uh, pro football does. Right. And, in fact, you advocated that really early, I think, if I, if I remember. I advocated it back in about 2013, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we give all the players that suit up, usually 75 or 80 players, like 300 bucks a game? You know, that's 21000 or 22000 or whatever. And uh, they could pay their parents' travel, maybe a hotel, maybe go out to dinner with their parents or their girlfriend or whatever. And let them share in the enormous amount of money is coming in. Uh, but I remember some of our commissioners saying that will never happen. <laughs> I said, yeah, it will, too. You just wait. It's going to happen. And then they came up with that cost of attendance, they call it. Yeah. And uh, and all the scholarship athletes were getting, oh, six, six, seven thousand a year or so forth. And then it expanded from that, obviously. Let's talk about Florida a little bit. Uh, you and I intersected briefly. I was there your first year. Uh, I was working at the Miami Herald, but would fly to Gainesville or wherever y'all were playing every week in 1990, uh, which you brought the fun and gun offense, which it was called air ball here, if yeah. I remember. Right? I sort of like yeah. air ball better. Air, do you? Truth, yeah. uh -huh. <clears throat> air ball. Yeah. yeah. Why? Well, fun and gun just sounds like you're out there throwing the ball all over the ballpark. Oh, but, like, like, <laughs> but we actually, you know, we ran the ball as, yeah. as much as we threw it. And uh, when we won the ACC here at Duke, Randy Cuthbert, our running back, mm -hmm. gained over 1,000 yards. Mm -hmm. And he only started the last six games. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had 150 a game, just about uh, those. So, uh, But we did call it air ball here in, in honor of basketball. Yeah. You know, where a guy shoots and misses. The right. Fans it was a different, different so uh, our students, connotation. Uh, our yeah. students got a kick out of when we had a long, long pass, yeah. they, they'd yell the air ball. Right. So I always sort of liked that. It had, had a little better ring to it, I think, than fun and gun. Fun and gun. Well, at Florida, you had an incredible success. What was it like coaching there after you had won the Heisman Trophy there as a player? Well, you don't, I don't think when you get into coaching, you, you try to do the best wherever you are and whatever next opportunity may come around, you go from there. And, uh, I mean, looking back, if uh, – if we don't beat Clemson that day, we'd have been one and four and maybe ended up 
four and seven, five and six. I don't know how we would have ended up, but I never would have been the Florida coach. Mm. So uh, it happened, and obviously the opportunity to go back to my alma mater, a school that uh, had never really excelled to the, the potential that Florida has. Oh, that was just a tremendous opportunity. And uh, when I came down there and mentioned we got a team capable of winning the SEC this year, people sort of laughed. I said, wait a minute now. But I, I, I can assure you, Scott, when uh, the team we had down there in 90, I mean, we're showing them all the tapes of film of uh, our Duke players. They looked at that and they said, you know what? If th those guys can win a championship, we can win one. Simple huh. as that. Because yeah. we, we had a bunch of guys go to the NFL all the time. And we had very few here at Duke that won that championship. So I credit that Duke team for <laughs> the success I had uh, after that. Right, you had a, and in general, you had much better players at Florida. I mean, oh, much yeah, bigger, NFL ready. Oh, yeah. They're yes. bigger. They're a little uh, yeah. more into football. Uh, we still were a very much academic school here at Duke, but mm -hmm. uh, I tell you what, they played their hearts out. We played with effort and attitude. That's how we won it. We didn't win it because right. we had more guys going to the NFL than they did. Yeah. When did they start calling you or or the the head ball coach uh, that nickname? Oh, I think four or five years in, I used to use the term ball coach, just ball coach. When I really admired and respected somebody, I would say, like Pat Summit at Tennessee, whether man or woman, I'd say she is really one of the best ball coaches there's ever been mm -hmm. in any sport. Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend of ours down there, he, he said, uh, ball coach, he said, well, you must be the head ball coach. I said, well, everybody's the head ball coach, <laughs> whatever sport they're in. So he started using it a little bit, and I guess it spread around. Caught on. And the visor, yeah. when did that start? Was that also when you came to Florida because it was it so hot? It started at Florida. Or, yeah, yeah, it started pretty much at Florida. Uh, what happened here, that day we upset Clemson, it was a rainy day. Mm. It was a miserable day, but it wasn't real windy. And uh, so I wore a hat, and, uh, of course, we won that game, so I, I wore a hat the rest of the season. Same hat? Uh, same Are you superstitious? Well, I, I said, I'm going to wait till we lose one. We never <laughs> lost one. Okay. So uh, that's when I wore a hat. But when I got to Florida, I looked around, and not many coaches were wearing visors. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that saying, uh, to be successful in life, there's two ways to do it. You can do it like everybody else does it and try to outwork them, or you can do it differently. So I said, I don't think I'm going to stay up to midnight trying to outwork everybody. Uh, so wearing a visor was just a little something different. And even the way we coached was a little, a little different, I thought. So that, that was one reason I did it. But I wore a visor on the golf course all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was just natural. Why, why would you wear a hat when it's 90 degrees down there and so forth? You were widely known as an offensive mastermind. Um, so, and you got to call plays incredibly early. Didn't you call some plays in high school when you were in Tennessee or something? I mean, you, uh, you had no, more back, play yeah. calling experience than most people oh, yeah. would have. Yeah. Back when I played, uh, the quarterback called play. Oh, that uh, was just the way it went? Yeah, uh, high school, okay. college. Every now and then they'd send one in, hmm. and they, they'd spot something and send it in, which was fine. Uh, but I I called them in high school and in college. So you called and, all uh, the Florida A plays. couple of pro yeah. games. And I talked yeah. uh, our head coach let me call them one game when we were about – one and nine, I think, or something. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I was used to calling plays. So Why do you think you were so good at it? Well, I don't know if I was so good at it because I look back on about seven or eight games and I said, why in the heck did you call that stupid play? But uh, I don't know. We, uh, uh, I think having the freedom here with Coach Red Wilson was really helpful because uh, I remember asking him one time, uh, you know, how you want me to call the plays, you know what I mean? be conservative, run, throw, what he said, call whatever you want. And he said, I, I want to throw the ball, and I, and I love trick plays. Oh, I want okay. some double passes yeah. and reverse passes and what have you. So Coach Wilson really uh, gave me the freedom to, you know, innovate uh, through the offense. And, and we had a bunch of good players here. You know, Ben Bennett came in 80 right when I came. And uh, the receivers here, Chris Castor was ACC Player of the Year, year Cedric Jones, Marvin Brown, a bunch of those guys. And uh, Clarkson Hines, you know, Clarkson right? came yeah. in the late 80s, yeah. the second, the second, second trip time back. around. Yeah. And uh, of course, he was AC player of the year mm -hmm. also. So is it apocryphal or is it really true that you would draw plays mm -hmm. uh, in oatmeal or cereal or uh, besides? I mean, is that you ever really do that? 
Oh, I Ben Bennett used to tell that story. I don't remember exactly <laughs> that, but I do remember uh, back in about eighty one or two. Uh, we were playing a team, and Rich McGeorge was like a volunteer coach, and he would drive back and forth from Greensboro. Mm. Uh, he came back, but we had a little tight end drag route and a couple of crossers, and Rich was the tight end coach. He said, Coach, when did you put that play in? I said, oh, I forgot to tell you, we put that during the Friday afternoon walkthrough. And he said, that's a dang good play. I know it scored, it scored against Virginia. But the tight end coach didn't know we had that play for the tight end for a touchdown. Because yeah, it was pretty simple. You know, you run yeah. here and you run here and you run underneath. And, you know, everybody uses that play now. You nicknamed uh, Florida's field the Swamp, too, right? That really came from you? Yeah, uh, we were looking for a good nickname. And uh, our sports information director gave me four or five suggestions that okay. have come down through the past uh, Norm Carlson, who was there, oh, I think, was about 40 yeah. years or 50 mm -hmm. years or so. And uh, I said, you know, that one, the swamp, sounds pretty good. Maybe I'll call the local sports writer, Mike Bianchi, yeah. and uh, see what he thinks about it. So he wrote an article. So said, we're going to start calling this place the swamp. And one of the sports information guys said, that'll never work. That's a stupid name, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I said, well, let's give it a chance. I like it. Uh, so it hit, and, of course, it stuck. Yeah, the Gators swamp. always survive in the swamp, right? That was the sort yeah, of the line. Yeah, it's Florida. Yeah. You know, we got a lot of swampy land. And actually, our stadium in Gaines was built, uh, according to the history books, on a swampy piece of land uh, just south of the university there. I didn't know so that. So it was, yeah. Uh, yeah, they had to sort of drain and put some let, let some of the water flow down a little creek down downstream there a bit. So it, it was built over a, a little bit of a swamp. To back up for a second, but your Heisman Trophy, uh, your win, you won in 1966. Time is out, and Heisman winner Steve Spurrier will attempt a 40-yard field goal, something he has never accomplished before. Hold your breath. The ball is towed and is on target. Steve has done it again. A 40-yard field goal to give Florida their seventh straight victory. We did one of these interviews, as, as we mentioned off air, with George Rogers. His Heisman, we went to his house, and his Heisman's actually in his, on his mantle. Um, where do you keep yours? Well, we have a restaurant down there now. Uh, it's called Spurrier's Gridiron Grill. Uh, so it's right in the middle. We've got a big old trophy case there. Uh, of course, we got a bunch of Duke stuff also, South Carolina stuff, uh, along with the Gator stuff. Uh, so it's right uh, in the middle sort of the restaurant. We got some private rooms on the back and sort of the open uh, restaurant part in the front. Uh, so it's uh, part of the memorabilia uh -huh. showcase. I call yeah, it, it sounds like a great place. It's I sort of called it a museum. So, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. right there along with so much other stuff. No, that's awesome. I'm, I, next time I'm in Gainesville, I'm yeah. going there for sure. You and the field there now is named for you. Right. That must have been a big honor. It was a, definitely a very big honor. Jeremy Foley, the athletic director, uh, called me up as I was leaving uh, South Carolina to come back home to set, to speak of. And uh, he said, we, we're going to put your name on the stadium, Steve Spurrier, Florida Field. Uh, and uh, we're going to give you a little job called Ambassador, give you an office, somewhere to go every day. <laughs> and I read in a book one time, uh, in life, you need to have somewhere to go every day. Don't just wake up and look at your wife and say, what are we going to do today? Uh -huh. uh, so, I mean, I don't have to go every day, but yeah. every now and then you need somewhere to go. Yeah. And anyway, uh, so it's worked out very nicely over the last, what, seven, eight years. It's gone just like that. And you and your wife, Jerry, who you met in college, mm -hmm. y'all live in Gainesville yeah. most of the time now? Is that, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I had originally thought maybe – go live at the beach. I mm -hmm. love going to the beach a week or two uh, at a time. I've never been there a month or anything. So after we left South Carolina, we were down there about a month or so. She said, I don't know hardly anybody down here. And I said, I don't either. <laughs> uh, and then the opportunity to come back to Gainesville, uh -huh. and that was only natural. So we got a condo down at the beach, uh, right near St. Augustine, Crescent Beach. So we don't go near as much as we thought we would, mm -hmm. but uh, we did go a couple of days last week and that's about it two days and then come on back there you go uh, yeah yeah the um national championship was in the 1996 season 96 i remember season. that right and the issue has long since been resolved here the florida gators number three have defeated florida state number one and the florida gators are now anticipating 
a national championship their first. And that's going to do it. The ball game is over. The Florida Gators have staked their claim for the national championship of the 1996 season. Was that the biggest thrill at Florida? I mean, that, that you know, to win that one was that the of all the highlights at Florida as a coach was that. Well, I guess it one? was the biggest championship since yeah. it was the national. But we were we were extremely fortunate. Uh, we had some other teams that are very close to the '96 team overall in talent. Not quite as good, probably. '96 was statistically still our best team in the 12 years I was there. But we got a lot of help. You know, we we said a lot of thank you, Lords, uh, because we lost the last game of the season to FSU, 24-21 uh, at their place. If we'd lost the first game of the season to them, we would have been definitely playing for the national championship. But when you lose the last one, it's almost whoop. We went from one or two in the nation to about number five. Mm. And then all of a sudden the teams that were in front of us started losing. Ohio State lost one. Uh, Nebraska lost one in that Big 12 game. And then uh, Arizona uh, State uh, was undefeated. They lost in the Rose Bowl. And then all we had to do was beat Alabama and FSU, <laughs> which we did, yeah, and uh, yeah. to be national champs. But if either one of those teams maybe had won their bowl game or, or won their uh, championship game, uh, they might have been ranked ahead of us. There was no playoff back then. Mm -hmm. So right. we, we were very blessed, and we said a lot of thank you, Lords, after that. You had some yeah. wonderful one-liners throughout your career. Um, Florida State, you labeled as Free Shoes University mm -hmm. during their um, shoe scandal that they had. Well, you know, this summer, Steve Spurrier took a little poke at the Knowles when after their controversial shopping spree by the part of several players and Steve referred to it as free shoes you and I said to Bobby I said coach you handled that rather well you had a little chuckle about it didn't you I'm a humorist I love humor you know and 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 uh, I got a, was amused uh, for it I would like to fire back but it goes right on his bulletin board I don't give him nothing to fire back at me you know and uh, uh, but uh, Steve, Steve, I, I really like it. Be honest with you, I like it. His coaching is very, uh, it, it's, it's daring. You know, I like daring. And, and your rivalry with FSU was interesting. Can you sort of just describe that? I mean, you were, you were on, in your autobiography, you were, you were on, honestly angry sometimes that their defensive players thought, mm -hmm. at least in the mid-90s, that they tried to hurt people. Well, uh, they uh... – they actually talked about if you knock the quarterback out of the game with a clean hit, that's football. I don't think that's football. And uh, they talked about hitting to the echo of the whistle. Well, nobody else hits after the whistle. And uh, and they bragged about, you know, knocking a bunch of ACC quarterbacks out of games. And, uh, and they knocked uh, Danny Warford down, I think it was 34 times after he'd thrown the ball in the game up there. So, uh, anyway, but it's history. I, I hate – try to bring all that back up. Uh, but And they don't play that way now. Yeah. You know, I actually tell some of the FSU people, I said, I actually, maybe pull for you guys and uh, every now and then because you guys play like everybody else now. You don't try <laughs> to hurt people and this, that, and the other. But that was that was their defensive team. Their offensive team was outstanding. Warwick Dunn, Peter Warwick, and all those guys. And uh, they were class, fine Christian people and everything. So it was just – a little extra on the hit side, uh, but anyway, that that was history, and uh, and it was it is history. Uh, you wrote of regrets. You said, "I now realize I should have stayed at Florida longer." Uh, why is that? Well, history would say you should do that, but back in those days, uh, I don't know how many people when they can double or triple whatever they're making in life, uh, they say, "No, I must stay here." But for some reason, I always thought, "Well, I'll." coach at Florida 10 to 15 years or 10 to 12 years or something like that, and then maybe go to the NFL. Yeah, I went to the wrong NFL team, but anyway, that's okay. <laughs> we wound up 5-11, and 11, not very good, uh, but there was some worse than us. I guess that's one positive way to look at it. We weren't the worst team in the league. By doing going to the wrong NFL team, I got a chance to go to South Carolina and have uh, 10 wonderful years down there with those, those people. And, uh, you know, set a bunch of school records that we still own. And uh, 
I don't know when they're going to break them, but it may be a long time before they win 11 games. and finish. Three years in a row, too. Yeah, we yeah. won 11, finished top 10 in the nation, three years in a row. So, And I still wish we could have won one SEC because I think we had the team that was capable. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seemed like, again, we would lose that one game. And uh, the other team, Georgia or even Missouri, they both went 7-1 and one in conference play a couple of those years. Uh, when we were six and two in conference play, but uh, yeah, it didn't work out. But still, they were they were three three of the best years in school history. And people in uh, South Carolina admire you so much for beating Clemson five years in a row. That was big, right? I mean, to, your arch rival. That yeah, we got on a run there. Uh, let's see, we beat them at nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and then it seems like. Uh, we, we'd get all the breaks. You know, something would happen. They would drop a pun or something would happen. And uh, and then we'd play extremely well. And that'll do it. Well, somebody got the bowl ball, Coach. The Gamecocks are going to win this one 31-17. to 17. It's the first time that the Gamecocks have won five in a row against the Tigers. Yeah, we, we were able to... Uh, get the upper hand on those guys for quite a while. But, uh, and that, that helped us to, to finish in the top 10 in the country, which was one of our goals uh, most all those years. At Washington, you know, I always wished, I've covered the Panthers for the entire time they've been there, 30 years almost. And I always wished that that had worked out. Were the Panthers ever in the ballpark for your services? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. I, I think uh, I went somewhere where they offered the most money, which was the mistake I made. But mm -hmm. that's okay. That mm -hmm. Gave me a chance, like I said, to end up going to South Carolina later. Mm -hmm. In fact, Mike McGee hired me, who was a, right. a Duke man. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. At South Carolina, right, 11, uh, three 11-win 11 seasons. You had Jadavion Clowney, Connor Shaw, so many stars. Uh, and then you sort of fired yourself, I guess, in 2015. You just you can't keep a head coach that's done it as long as I have when it's heading in the wrong direction. And really today, when I move out of the way and Sean Elliott's going to take over as the interim head coach, it sort of starts our rebuilding or building back uh, what we had just two years ago. And it was only two years ago that we were fourth in the nation and uh, the last of those 11 and twos. And somehow or another, uh, we've slid, and it's my fault. I'm responsible. I'm the head coach. And it's time for me to sort of get out of the way and let somebody ha else have a go at it. Tell me yeah. why you decided not to well, do I, it I anymore. Well, I made some mistakes. I, I had a yeah. coaching staff a little bit in disarray, and I had a few players. Uh, I would ask them to do something, and they, they look at me like, I don't have to listen to you anymore, or something like that. So it, it really, that was the point. I, mm -hmm. I, I admit, I, I guess I'd lost the team. Our quarterback, we, we had a running quarterback. All of a sudden, we were uh, becoming more of a, you know, run, quarterback run type thing. And I just said, I, you know, this team doesn't listen to me, so I need to get out of here. And, you know, in mm -hmm. the 80s, said, won't you wait till the end of the season? And now, so now, I said, I do not want to go stand on the sideline Last game he's ever going to coach here. Last game I, I said, no, I just need to go get out now and let maybe an assistant coach win some games here and maybe have a chance to be the head coach. And because the interim coach, as you know, get hired a lot. Uh, Mississippi State hired an interim guy. Uh, so anyway, I, I thought maybe that would happen, but uh, they didn't win enough games with that team we had. And I made a lot of mistakes within the coaching staff that led to maybe all that stuff happening. I don't know. But it was it was it was time for me to get out of there. Hmm. Simple as that. And you, I know, have had a you know another run at coaching until this. Uh, oh, the, wonderful yeah. run! Was that fun? Oh, yeah. the Orlando Apollos. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about Tim that. Tim Ruskell yeah. was our general manager. Uh, J.K. McKay was like a vice president guy, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, coaching the Orlando Apollos. We we ended up seven and one, uh, and then the league folded, went busted, or whatever. And uh, Lee Corso told me that that's the best coaching job you did in your life. I said, come on, coach. He said, no, I'm serious. You guys really played well. And we did play well. We, uh, uh, every game we had a lead, we ran the clock out. Mm -hmm. Our quarterback, uh, uh, Garrett Gilbert, uh, had a heck of a year. Uh, we 
led the conference in offense and scoring and uh, our field goal kicker, Elliot Fry, who kicked for us at South Carolina. He was 14 out of 14. Mm. I mean, we, we just played efficiently. And what was interesting, uh, we won a game out at Utah where the Gators played uh, a week ago or so and uh, started snowing about 4 o'clock for a 7 o'clock game. And that snow was all covered the field. <laughs> and uh, I remember coming in uh, and telling our team, I said, fellas, us Florida boys, we're all Florida boys, if we could win a game in the snow, we'd have something to remember the rest of our lives. Uh -huh. And our guys went out and played one of the best games of the year. Really did. Really? Yeah. yeah. We had no turnovers. I think we won like 24 to 11 or 12 or something like that. But uh, that, that was fun. And tell me what your secret to the uh, Fountain of Youth is here. I know you've, you always, I believe, were a big exercise guy. I'm in uh, pretty good cardio shape, I think. Yeah. I've got a little arthritis in my lower back, so i got a little gimpy in my walk. Uh, but, yeah, I've always been, uh, well, I was a runner until my second knee surgery, I guess. And Doc said, you need to get on that bike now. Mm. So I've been on the bike for the last uh, oh, 15 to 18 years, probably something like that. So, yeah, I, I enjoy getting a good sweat, good workout, setups, a few little hand weights, nothing real big. Uh, but I just think that's, you know, that's key to living kind a long time, being in good health and so forth. So I do try to continue that. Would you ever coach again? Uh, no, not as a head coach. Uh, you know, one of those analyst type things uh, mm -hmm. where you can advise here, there, and the other. Uh, that might be uh, something. I'm still waiting on my son, Steve Jr., to get a head coaching job. He's had several interviews, and it, oh, for man. some reason it hadn't worked out. Uh, I was hoping he's going to get the UNC Charlotte job last year. He interviewed there, but oh, uh, yeah. they went, of course, in another direction. Uh, but anyway. Uh, and he is uh, where now? He's at the uh, University of Tulsa. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Tulsa University. Okay. Uh, he's offensive coordinator with Kevin Wilson. Mm. So if he ever was a head coach, you'd be the oh, uh, unofficial advisor or some oh, sort of I, I wouldn't yeah. get in the way or anything. Yeah, anyway, right. You know. Okay, first of all, I'm resigning. I'm not retiring. i to get that part straight. I, uh, I doubt if I'll ever uh, be a head coach again, but, you know, maybe coaching a high school team or something. Uh, so don't say I've retired completely from coaching. Who knows what will come in the future? And what's uh, Scotty doing? Uh, Scotty is the uh, special team coordinator with Bobby Stoops in the XFL last year in uh, Arlington, Texas. Uh, they had they won the championship of the XFL. And let me tell you how they did it. They were four and six in the regular season, but somehow they won their division, their side of it, and they played Houston again. And I think uh, Houston had beaten them twice in the regular season. But somehow or another, uh, Bobby Stoops, they reorganized a little bit and did some things different. And uh, they beat Houston and, and then beat uh, Washington, uh, a team that came in like uh, Lebanon won or something like that. I'm not sure what their record was. So they won two games and won the championship. With a six and six record. How about that? And, uh, there you go. And I told him, I said, you guys played a lot better, and you <laughs> coaches coached a lot better too. And he said, you're right. You know, a lot of times people they don't realize the coaches have bad games too, and I've had some bad games, uh, but they they coach better and played better, and that's of course the key for key to winning. One thing I always uh, like so much about you, coach, was that you said what you meant, and obviously you still do, but. Uh, the, you didn't really do a lot of coach speak. Like, I think my favorite quote you ever had was when in South Carolina, you would say of Georgia, I sort of always liked playing them that second game because you could always count on them having two or three key players suspended. That's, that was nah, that was a good one. You that just, was back when they used to suspend players in college. <laughs> they don't suspend players for anything. Now, I remember asking uh, our uh, academic advisor at Florida one time, I said, now, you guys suspended Ike Hilliard, All-American wide receiver, for the Georgia game back in 96 for class attendance. Oh, class uh, attendance. Yeah, just class attendance. Yeah. And uh, I said, how come I never read anybody in the country getting suspended for class attendance? I said, well, do we still have that policy? He said, well, we sort of got it, but nobody pays any attention to it. I said, okay. So, anyway. <laughs> but we true. paid you attention never to it back in our Yes, day. yes, right. Yeah, we had to play the Bulldogs without our – Without Hilliard? All-American. Oh, shoot. But yeah. we, we still won easily that day. 
Your yeah. thoughts on ACC expansion, Stanford, Cal, and SMU coming into the league? Well, I wish that uh, they would just bring their football teams into and let all the other sports stay in the conference they were in. Uh, but I don't guess they're going to do that. Uh, I still don't know how they're going to do all the other sports, you know, volleyball, soccer, That's tennis, serious swimming. Serious road trips. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but anyway, it, it is what, what it is. Uh, Big Ten, they're going across country and so forth now. And uh, – I guess they'll work it out. I guess they got enough money to travel. Uh, but still, parents getting a chance to watch their kids play uh, is a, a little difficult now. Uh, but we'll see how it works out. I, I think a lot of – most of the people would rather keep competing against the same teams we always have. Uh, but it, it's about to change. You mentioned that Clemson-Duke game has been so instrumental in your life, really, career. Uh, what is your most – favorite win that you've ever had well you look back when your coaching career is over and uh, you can see the crucial wins that helped you stay alive as a coach yes, or whatever yeah. and, and lead to maybe another opportunity or whatever uh, uh, certainly that win over Clemson uh, was huge because it led to the ACC championship the only one in 60 years uh, here at Duke so that one uh, was one of the best ever and, uh, and then there was a few at South Carolina, a few at Florida. I hate to uh, start ranking all of them. Uh, but certainly uh, when you have one of those crucial wins where your guys really played well and they're able to continue that uh, maybe throughout the season, uh, then you look back and say, man, that was a big win for us because that's what it led to mm -hmm. having a, a super great year. Just got like one or two more, Coach. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we didn't talk at all about your NFL career. Could, I know it wasn't probably all you wanted. Mm -hmm. Could it have been more while well, you're in a bad situation? Were there other factors? What? Well, I tell people all the time, uh, I've coached three pro teams. Do you know that? No. Huh? Okay. Oh, well, well, the Bandits, I Tampa guess. Tampa Bay yeah. Bandits. Uh -huh. uh, we were 35 and 20, mm -hmm. which was right at uh, about 66%. And then the Apollos were seven and one. I think that's about eighty percent or something in it. So the only one uh, I, I didn't do very well was the Washington team, and I, I, I really wasn't in charge. Okay? Well, Dan Snyder uh, was the general manager, right? When, when the owner and general manager picked the quarterbacks the second year, that, that, that's when I knew I got to get out of here. But, was that the same person though, the owner and the general manager? Yeah. I mean, he yeah. was your general manager. I right? thought I was going to get a general manager, but I found out. Uh, you thought you were going to get Bobby Beathard, I think, yep. right? Bobby yeah. wanted to come yeah. back, and uh, it didn't work out between he and the owner. So, so I got him. Uh, but anyway. I, I guess I'm asking about your playing yeah. career, though. Like where, oh, my playing yeah, career? Yeah, playing career-wise. Well, I got a chance to play behind John Brody for about six, seven years as a backup, right. and that extended my NFL career. And I uh, played a little bit here and there. But uh, I got ten years in somehow, <laughs> and uh, – and punted, too. Oh, right? I was a punter, yeah, yeah a couple of years, two or couple three of years, years, this, yeah. that, and the other. But uh, I was just, you know, I was fortunate and blessed that Dickie hired me to start with at Florida and then Pepper Rogers and then Coach Red Wilson here at Duke. And they they, they kept me alive as a coach, and, man, I'm always uh, grateful to those three guys. And then Duke University, Tom Butters hired me back as the head coach uh, in 87. And uh, – and, and, and on from there. Duke took a chance on you twice, didn't they, at really critical moments uh, in your coaching Well, it career. gave me the opportunity. Yeah. I don't know if it's a chance because our offenses were doing pretty well. <laughs> well that was pretty good. Yeah. But they didn't know that at the time. I mean, you were, you were not Tom at Tom Butters yeah. told me one time that uh, one of the administrative people came in and, and told him, I said, Mr. Butters, I said, I don't think I'd hire Spurrier. He said, why? He said, because he'll come in here and win a whole bunch of games and leave. <laughs> and he said, well, let me tell you what. If he comes in here and wins a whole bunch of games and leaves, he'll be the first coach in Duke history to ever do that. <laughs> so, so I was the first to do that. <laughs> well, that's a good uh, note to conclude yeah. on, I think. Yeah. Uh, that's Coach Steve Spurrier. Thank you so much for doing this, Coach. Oh, enjoyed it, Scott. Thanks again to Audi Charlotte for sponsoring this episode. Celebrate the season with holiday savings on new Audis. You belong in an Audi from Audi Charlotte.
Thanks so much for listening to Sports Legends of the Carolinas, a production of the Charlotte Observer. This show is produced by Lou May Ali Sally, Jeff Siner, and Cotta Stevens. The sports editor of the Charlotte Observer is Lydia Craver, and the executive editor is Raina Cash. Remember, you'll find much more about this interview and about all of our guests, including Steph Curry, Roy Williams, Dale Earnhardt Jr., and Don Staley, in our Sports Legends book. Pre-order your copy now at sportslegendsbook.com. For lots more sports content and to continue supporting this kind of work, please visit charlotteobserver.com and consider a digital subscription. And connect with me on Twitter at Scott underscore Fowler or email at sfowler at charlotteobserver.com. See you next time.